BC, the model of the year, the model of the great year, we'll point out. Here's where our vernal equinox is now, the cusp of Aquarius and Pisces. And you follow this up here, and you'll see the cusp of Virgo and Leo. And here is the pointer of the cosmic clock turning this way, like this, through the, through the 12 sun. Just like imagine a giant clock face with 12 hours on it, but these are cosmic hours. And it turns, and as it turns, it's pointing to the critical spots within the, within the circuit. And this here is a critical zone. This is a critical zone, this is a critical zone, and this is a critical zone. And you see here, this, in fact, the whole propeller is turning. The whole propeller is turning. And here you see spring equinox associated with Taurus the bull, the Scorpio associated with autumn equinox, summer solstice with Leo, winter solstice with Aquarius. Now this is the model of the great year. And this is something that everybody if they can consider themselves an educated person, should have some grasp of this because it's extremely important, extremely important. Now, the present order of nature that we have been in goes from here back to here. During the age of Taurus, there was a major shifting of gears that occurred, major shifting of gears. And it's only after that shifting of gears that what we know as modern civilization began in the latter days of Taurus and the earlier days of Aries. This would be roughly 43,000, I mean 4,320 years ago. This right here would have been 6,480 years ago. This would have been half the cycle or 12,960 years ago. The vernal equinox entered the age of Leo and all shit broke loose and the old order of things was completely turned upside down, shaken, broken apart, and its pieces scattered about the entire face of the earth. That, that was the age of Leo. We then went into two periods, symbolized by Cancer and Gemini, that is known as the age of the goddess. Climatologists refer to that period of time as the hypsothermal. When we go back to here, 13,000 years ago, during these ages, we're back in the depths of the ice age, where the amount of ice on the, wall, on the surface of the earth was three times as massive as, as it is now. And during that time, the climate of Georgia, if you think this is cold, the climate of Georgia had a climate similar to southern Canada. Georgia was buried under massive amounts of snowfall every year although we were far enough removed from the great ice cap that the snow would melt off each year. But if you traveled north of here, once you crossed the Ohio River that marks the border of Kentucky with Ohio, you would have been at the ice cap that reached from there all the way to the Arctic Circle and from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And that was only part of the ice that encompassed the Earth back during the winter of the great year. Well, the emergence from that winter of the great year was extremely catastrophic. And the catastrophe happened, the first catastrophe happened right precisely on that cusp. That was followed by a succession of catastrophes that lasted through the entire age of Leo. When we back up into this period of time, if we could have, jump in a time machine and go back 13,000 years ago and get out in Georgia, back in the age of Virgo, it would have been a vastly different place. In addition to the boreal or northern forests, we would have had to contend with three species of elephants living here, including woolly mammoths and mastodons. We would have had to contend with um, saber-toothed cats. We would have had to contend with um, giant armadillos that were about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle car. We would have had to contend with beavers that were about the size of grizzly bears. We had to contend with giant ground sloths whose heads probably reached four feet or five feet above this ceiling when they stood on their hind legs. And the list could go on and on and on. 
There was a, an extraordinary, amazing megafauna in the unglaciated parts of the world back during this section of the great year. All of those species that were alive on the earth as the spring equinox went into the age of Leo were gone by the time we came out of the age of Leo. Some of these, like mastodons, which had roamed Georgia for four million years, were gone. The giant Pleistocene lion that could weigh up to 1,500 pounds and had 50 to 60 percent more body mass than the largest modern African lions, also an inhabitant of here in Georgia, been around for at least a million years. Gone. The list could go on and on. There was, in fact, worldwide, going into the age of Leo, there were approximately 130 to 140 species of large, as they're called, mega mammals with a body weight greater than 100 pounds that went extinct. Now, by comparison, there's about the same number of large species of animals the world over today. If we took a census of all the large animals in all the continents, North America, we have black bears, brown bears, wolves, coyotes, moose, musk ox, et cetera, et cetera, in other, in other Africa, of course, is where we find the, the greatest number of large animals. But the number of large animals over the whole earth today, if we made a whole list of every species of animal over about 100 pounds in body weight, would be about equal to the number of species that didn't make this transition. In other words, the earth played host to roughly double the number of large mammal species here than it has here. And scientists, paleontologists, are still arguing because they don't know what actually happened to those animals. The irony of, of it is, is we can talk about the extinction of the dinosaurs, which disappeared from the planetary stage 65 million years ago, and we know more about what terminated the dinosaurs than we do about what terminated the woolly mammoths 13,000 years ago. Now this is a bit, this is odd. But this, to me, is a measure of how severe some of the changes were when you look at its effects on life, on the biosphere. And that what we see is a selective decimation of the top of the food chain that occurred during the age of Leo. Now, something else happened in the age of Taurus. And the latest scientific research, and I'm not going to get into it tonight, but if we do a class, an extended class, where we get into this stuff in depth, we'll talk about that. The latest scientific research is suggesting that perhaps during the age of Taurus, something happened that eliminated 80% of the human population. And in fact, what we might be seeing with the emergence of recorded history in ancient Samaria and in the ancient Indus Valley is in reality the rebooting of human civilization after the events in the age of Taurus. But the events in the age of Taurus, as it turns out, weren't nearly as severe as the events in the age of Leo. The events that were in the age of Leo completely rearranged the balance of nature, completely. You have to picture, we're, and this is something that I like to devote a whole class to, is discussions of climate change, because climate change now has become a political football. And you've got lots of different contending sides arguing about climate change and what should be done about it and what's our role in it and so forth. But the problem is that in of those discussions, there's almost a complete absence of the discussions regarding the climate changes that have occurred repeatedly long before we created an industrial civilization. And we don't have the explanation for what caused those. Right here, and I, we're probably going to run out of time, so I won't be able to show you those Greenland and Antarctic graphs that you've seen. But to put this in perspective, the estimate as to the warming of Earth's climate since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, let's say at 18, around 1850, to now, the high estimate is about one degree, the low estimate's about a half a degree, the middle range is about 0.6 to 0.7 degrees, so less than a degree. The average of most assumptions of, as to how much the Earth's average global climate has warmed since the Industrial Revolution began is about three quarters of a degree. 
And it's done this in 150 years. Right smack in the middle of the age of Leo, there was a warming event called the Younger Dryas Preboreal Transition. That warming event was estimated to be 17 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit compared to three quarters of a degree. And that warming took place in less than five years. And nobody knows why yet. In less than five years. Now, it's also no coincidence that that warming event seems to have coincided with the final demise of the great mega mammals. And yet, despite the fact that those two things are overwhelmingly correlated in time, the prevailing interpretation as to what caused the extinction of the mega mammals is human hunting. Human hunting. Which, of course, puts the blame on us bad old humans. However, I'm extremely skeptical of that idea for a number of reasons. For one thing, that theory completely ignores the correlation that I just, that I just explained to you about this climate change, which is precise, by the way. Um, and that's only one of the climate changes. That's only one of them. I cite that one because it's become one of the most controversial and most famous because it was so severe and it was so rapid. Now, the other thing you've got to also appreciate is that while this ice was on the Earth, there was so much ice that, you know, Earth's hydrological budget is more or less constant. There's a small accretion of, of water to the Earth every day because of comets, basically, small comets that deliver deliver hydrous molecules to the earth constantly, adding very small incrementally to the amount of, of water on the surface of the earth. But for, for all practical purposes, over the centuries and even over the millennium, the amount of water on the surface of the earth is constant. So if we go into an ice age and that ice starts accumulating and building up, it's being diminished elsewhere. And of course where that is is in the ocean basins. So as the ice mass grows, ocean level drops. Does anybody in here besides guys that have been in my class know how many feet ocean level dropped during the ice age? Four feet? Ten feet? Forty feet? Eighty feet? How far did it drop? Now you know that in Al Gore's movie, if you watched Al Gore's movie, they're talking about the catastrophic consequences of a one to two foot rise in sea level over the next century and what that could do to coastal communities. <laughs> Well, at the end of the last ice age, as the great ice sheets rapidly and inexplicably melted away, sea levels worldwide rose by 400 feet. Now, what's that going to do to coastal communities? And what is going to happen in the transference of that water where it's locked up in the form of this tremendous amount of potential energy? Because you've got a picture that this ice cap over Canada in some places is perhaps three miles thick. Now, that, that amount of energy locked up in that frozen water is released, and that water starts going back to the Earth's ocean basins. Now, all of the world's cultures have myths and legends about what event? Flood. The Great Flood. The Great Flood, right. Now, you want to know how to drown a world? Well, first you put it into the depths of an ice age, and then you come up with some way to very rapidly melt that ice. Now, that's precisely what happened back in the age of Leo. And in the early 70s, climate scientists studying the, the, the melting of that ice came face to face with an inexplicable conundrum. The conundrum was this. They, in the old days, a hundred years ago, they imagined that the disappearance of the ice took 50,000 or 100,000 years. Now that's a nice, long, comfortable time span in which to provide copious amounts of solar energy distributed over these tens of thousands of years to slowly melt away the ice. But with the advent of radiocarbon dating in the early 50s, that began to shift. And what happened is it went from 100,000 to 50,000, from 50,000 to 25,000, 
from 25,000 to 15,000. And when it got to about 15,000 in the early 70s, there was a convention of climate scientists who got together and looked at it and said, wait a second now. If it only took 15,000 years to melt this mass of ice that was double the size of the amount of ice that's now at the South Pole, that requires a certain amount of heat energy, which they could get their calculators and you know quickly pick up their calculator. Of course, not one of these in the early 70s, but they do their calculations and they can figure out how many therms or BTUs, however, how many calories of heat it requires. What they realized was that, wait a second, there's not enough heat energy to melt the ice in, in 15,000 years as quick as it melted. So they started running some hypotheticals. They said, okay, in the present climate of Canada, which does not sustain an ice a permanent ice cap, it will have lots of snowfall for six months a year, but then as the summer warming comes around, the snow melts, it's released, it flows back into the streams and rivers, and ultimately goes back to the ocean or into the groundwater supply. But during an ice age, it's like the Earth, the whole planet, is locked in this winter that goes on for century after century after century. Finally, at the end of this, the whole big meltdown began. began. So they started calculating, and they came up, well, at the present climate of Canada, if it went from being a glacial arctic type climate where snow didn't melt, it fell but never melted, to now, how long would it take the ice to melt? And the answer was about 40,000 years. So then they said, well, wait a second, okay, let's look on planet Earth and see where is the most heat energy available anywhere on Earth? And the answer was over tropical oceans like in the Pacific. So they then calculated and came up with the amount of heat energy available over the tropical oceans, and it was still close to 30,000 years. So they then introduced a term called, a phrase that they called the energy paradox. And for the next three or four years, there was a bunch of articles written on it trying to figure out the solution to the energy paradox. And the energy paradox essentially said there wasn't enough energy to melt this ice. Well. What has happened between the early 70s and now? What has happened is this. The amount of time required to melt the ice has diminished from 15,000 years to only a little over the age of Leo. And in fact, within the age of Leo, it seems like there were two singular events where most of the melting took place. So in the 70s, they dealt with this, they couldn't come up with an answer, and finally there was an article, I think it came out in about 75 or 76, that said, there's an error in our data somewhere, we'll put this thing aside until we have more data to work with. They put it on the shelf, and it's still on the shelf. Nobody that I know of is, is in, in now addressing themselves to the resolution of the energy paradox. But the energy paradox basically confronted us with this possibility or the, the, the reality that there had been some enormous input of energy into the terrestrial system that triggered the melting of this ice. The melting of that ice then triggered extreme atmospheric responses and did a complete geomorphic rearrangement of the Earth's landscape and in the process eliminated uh, basically half of the top end of the food chain plus a lot of other things as a consequence. The energy paradox has still not been resolved. One reason why it has not been resolved is because in all of the attempted modeling that they did, all of the energy sources were terrestrial. But now, you see, when we reorient ourselves to the cosmic environment and we start invoking the possibility of cosmic sources of energy, it becomes a totally different ball game altogether. And what happened to trigger this? The evidence, the hard evidence, only emerged last year. And at this point, the vast majority of the human population is completely unaware and oblivious of this critical evidence that emerged last year. 